announced for the beginning of uh, a new uh, webinar uh, with two eminent uh, professors, uh, Professor Bandi from uh, India and Professor Absalamaid from Egypt. Uh, many thanks to my dear friend, Professor Cernivest, for his great uh, help and great support uh, to complete uh, this course. Uh, many thanks to the Egyptian Orthopedic Association and the Indian Orthopedic Association for sponsoring this course, for EVA Company for sponsoring this uh, webinar, and also for uh, Ortho TV for live streaming all the webinars to Asian countries. Thank you so much. Uh, our first speaker will be Professor Bandy, and Professor Senivas will introduce him. Professor Senivas. Thank you, Professor Elasha. Good evening, everybody. As always, I would like to thank uh, Professor Elasha, uh, Egyptian Orthopedic Association, Indian Orthopedic Association, and uh, Author TV uh, for these opportunities. For today's episode, I would like to thank uh, uh, Professor Vivek Pandey. Um, for uh, accepting the invite. Uh, professor Vivek Pandey uh, is Professor of Orthopedics and Unit Head at uh, um, KMC Kasturba Medical College, Manipal. Uh, he is the head of uh, Sports Injury and Arthroscopy Unit. Um, he has a H-index of 13, uh, which is very good. Uh, and he, is, uh, he has a fellowship experience in knee, shoulder, and elbow surgeries from Germany, Holland, and Italy, and uh, he has published in uh, national and international indexed uh, journals. Uh, he has 69 publications, and he's authored six orthopedic textbooks. Um, and his special area of interest is arthroscopy of the shoulder, knee, elbow, and ankle, complex knee and shoulder injuries, and periarticular fractures. He's a regular speaker, and uh, demonstrator of uh, uh, surgical techniques in national arthroscopy conferences in India. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pandey, for uh, accepting the invite. Um, he'll be speaking today on uh, uh, frozen shoulder, which uh, he has written about. Um, over to you, Professor Pandey. Um, thank you, Srinivas, sir, for your gracious introduction. And thank you, from the Indian Orthopedic Association and the Egyptian Orthopedic Association uh, in giving me this opportunity, uh, where today we'll be discussing you now a bit about the frozen shoulder. Now, let me just share my screen. Okay. All right. So, um, am I audible? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so now, I think frozen shoulder is one condition which almost every orthopedic surgeon treats, whether you are a sports person or not, whether you are, you know, I mean, as long as you are practicing general, something general, apart from your specialty practice, frozen shoulder arrives to everybody. Uh, and I believe this topic must be understood by everybody, right from the regis residents to the registrars and to the consultants. Uh, as Dr. Srinivas said, that we had recently also, you know, quite a lot worked on the frozen shoulder. We wrote a uh, the clinical guidelines in management of frozen shoulder in IGO. It's an update. And the how the shoulder, the practice of the frozen shoulder varies among the various shoulder specialists in the India. There's an article which is recently published in the OJSM. Uh, my entire talk is almost based upon these two. Uh, articles as well as <clears throat> my own personal experience, which we have practiced and published both. In next 20 to 30 minutes, we'll try to understand various concepts about the frozen shoulder, how various terminologies have been there in practice across the globe. What is the kind of definition which various uh, world agencies and people are following? What is the typical presentation of a frozen shoulder patient and a clinical scenario when they arrive you? When you see these patients, what are the differentials arise you know, in your mind before you investigate actually? And then how do you treat? And most of the treatment plan are based upon the staging which were given by the Reeves and the Neviazir. And what are the contentious issue in this entire frozen shoulder? Where, where are we still having not having a consensus? So, you know, the frozen shoulder 
you know, it has got a couple of names like adhesive capsulitis and periarthritis shoulder, frozen shoulder. And all three have been used across the world, you know, synonymously. Um, however, Isakos recommends currently using only frozen shoulder because the adhesive capsulitis is, is a kind of a bit misleading. Like it says adhesions in the capsule. I mean, you don't find any adhesions in the joint and around. Yeah, the capsule is tight and contracted, but there are no adhesions. Periarthritis, again, is a kind of a term. You don't know what is periarthritis. I mean, everybody knows arthritis, but what is periarthritis? So maybe the, you know, the ISA cost recommends that at the moment we should stick to the frozen shoulder. However, said that it does not make a difference because your treatment protocol remains the same. Isakos recently also has kind of classified the frozen shoulder as they also say that it's a stiff shoulder. Anything which is primarily stiff, where the cause is unknown, you don't know why it has become stiff, you can call it as frozen shoulder. And if you can find out a cause behind the stiffness, let's say there's an infection, inflammation, trauma, tumor, or something else, then it becomes a secondary stiff shoulder. In this current talk, we will talk only about the primary frozen shoulder or a primary stiff shoulder. Recently, a frost trial has been done in UK where they have tried to define the frozen shoulder where they say that it is frozen shoulder is characterized by the, the restriction of the passive second just Okay. Um, <clears throat> passive ER in the affected shoulder to less than 50% of the opposite shoulder with the normal radiographs. However, the strength of the rotator cuff is relatively unaffected. If you look at your clinical practice, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure all of us see the frozen shoulder, everybody. Who are these patients? What is the calmness presentation? Most of the time, they arrive to you with a gradual onset of pain and stiffness without any underlying cause. You talk about the trauma, you talk about any other joint involvement or anything. They'll say, no, I don't remember anything. My This shoulder has been becoming gradually painful and I'm unable to move it to the full extent. When you examine them, both active and passive range of motion are restricted generally in one, often in two, and rarely in three planes, all three planes. You take an x-ray, they are normal. And their association with the diabetes or pre-diabetes and thyroid is often seen. This is the most common presentation of any patient who has got a frozen shoulder. In my experience, we have found that the loss of external rotation, if you compare the both external rotation, keeping the arm by the side of the chest, loss of external rotation in adduction is one of the very earliest indicator of the frozen shoulder. Because we often fail to compare with the both the sides. Patient may have pain. You, if you don't compare with the other side, you will find that the, you know, you may find that this external rotation is normal. But if you compare with the other side, even if there's a 10 to 15 degree difference, it may be just the beginning of the extra, the frozen shoulder. So let's see a typical scenario. I'm just showing you a scenario. Here is a 45-year-old female who visited to us with a pain and difficulty movement in the right shoulder for two months, which was insidious and onset. Now look at the shoulder when she moves. You can say, okay, abduction is about 60 to 70 degree or maybe 80 degree, though she's giving a thoracic tilt. And her hand is reaching the head, which is important in for the women, especially because they have to do their hairs. And when she tried to turn, in the other video we'll see, it, it's difficult for her to reach the back. Now, this lady had an incidental onset of pain, which was localized, non-radiating. Radiating means, when I say radiating, no shoulder pain ever radiates to the hand. If the shoulder pain is radiating below the elbow, it is coming up to the forearm, thumb, or index finger. Trust me, you are not, not dealing with the shoulder pain, or there is a concomitant shoulder pain. If the pain is reaching the hand, then it is arising primarily from the cervical spine. Most of these patients, almost all patients who have frozen shoulder, they have pain at night. When you ask them, can you, can you sleep at that side of the shoulder? They say, no, I have not been sleeping because it is terribly painful. Night pain in the shoulder tells you one thing, that there is something wrong, but it doesn't tell you what is wrong. The only condition where the night pain is not observed is usually the bank cart lesion. Posterior labral can be sometimes painful at, the back, in, at night. 
Labral tears in general may not be painful at, at night, but all other conditions, whether you take ACG arthritis, frozen shoulder, rotator cuff tendinopathy, rotator cuff tear, partial cuff tear, glenohumeral arthritis, almost everything is painful at night. So it tells you that there is something wrong, but doesn't tell you what is wrong. Rest, everything was normal in this woman. And when we started examining, now you carefully observe here, when you examine this patient, this is extremely important for the residents and the, the new registrars. When you examine, always stabilize the scapula. Put your hand over the scapula and then gently move it. Now you see there's barely any abduction. You can call it as just about 15 to 20 degree of abduction. Whereas in the previous video, with the scapulothoracic movement and the thoracic tilt, she could elevate it almost to 90 degrees. So you cannot call it as 90 degree movement. Actual glenohumeral abduction in this woman is barely 10 to 15 degree. Now look at the external rotation. It's barely there. It's just about 5 to 10 degree, or you can say just neutral. Okay. So it means the movements are restricted in two planes. Now this is the third plane. Forward flexion is also limited. And when I ask her to put it at the back, that is the internal rotation. The normal side, left side is almost reaching up to the lower angle of the scapula, whereas left side is barely reaching the midline. When I check the cuff, the first and foremost cuff which I want to check is the, is the supraspinatus. The supraspinatus test was normal. Now, many people say that it's difficult to check the cuff in frozen shoulder, but if you ask an experienced for experienced shoulder surgeon, he will say that I can differentiate. Even if even a partial can be picked up with the experience. Yes, I agree that it may not be easy, but one must make a habit of testing all the cuffs. The belly press can be a little bit tricky because, you know, they, they, the internal rotation is contracted. I mean, it is limited. So belly press sometimes is pseudo positive. You may feel that it's positive, but it may not be. However, when you check the strength, strength will be okay. So she had a normal strength. Now with this, we know that it's a frozen shoulder, primary frozen shoulder, or a primary stiff shoulder. At this juncture, not in this patient per se, I'm talking about the patients where the movements are fairly good. I mean, you have a terminal restriction inflection, terminally, you know, 5 to 10, 15 degree, your external rotation is limited. What's the first thing which can come to mind? And patient gives you a history of, let's say, just six weeks, two months max. The first thing which could be possible is the cuff tendinopathy, which can be confused in the early stage. But the only difference is if you give the medications to these patients, they improve rapidly and they usually do not worsen. The cuff tendinopathy will remain the same and in the due course of time, it will improve. Whereas frozen shoulder will generally worsen. Partial or a full thickness cuff tear. Here, the cuff strength is always affected. And however, both can have an associated stiffness. In such cases, you, if you have a doubt, you always do the next investigation. Um, calcific tendinitis can also present with pain and stiffness, but here the X-ray is the confirmation. Glenohumeral osteoarthritis, yes. In, often it has happened that my residents have presented to me saying that it's a frozen shoulder. But remember, these patients are more aged, let's say 65, 70 plus. The duration of the pain and stiffness is far longer and it does not show any signs of repentance. I mean, your frozen shoulder usually will go up, it will have a plateau and it will improve. Whereas glenohumeral arthritis will never improve, it will keep on worsening. And when you do the movement, it's a stiff shoulder and you can actually find a lot of crepitus in the shoulder. That is the first indicator that there may be an arthritis in the shoulder. You take an x-ray, your diagnosis is clear. ACG arthritis, most of the time, the movements are nearly full and they'll always have a tenderness right over the AC joint. So these are the some differentials which you must keep it in mind. Now, here comes the most tricky point. You have a clinical diagnosis established that it's a frozen shoulder. Now, what's the next question? Should I investigate or should I treat directly? Now, investigate for what? I mean, do I want to confirm the, you know, the, let's say radiologically, should I prove that the capsule is contracted, there's a rotator interval inflammation, or I know that this is the clinical diagnosis, should I treat directly? So my uh, request would be at least do the baseline investigation. At least do the plain shoulder radiograph, just one plain AP X-ray suffices. Now, the X-ray on the left side of the screen, if you see, this is a patient who was referred to us with a frozen shoulder from one of the departments. 
he was complaining of pain for last few months, about two to three months, and he had pain. He also had a night pain. There was nothing else which was, you know, alarming. But when we saw the X-ray, we realized there were some lytic areas, very, very small lytic lesions. When we further investigated, he actually turned out to be a case of multiple myeloma, which was never diagnosed. So <clears throat> remember, a plain X-ray is not a harm. Always get a one plain X-ray. Okay, fair enough. Now an X-ray is done. Should I proceed? Not really. Always do the blood test. Random sugars, because remember the type 2 diabetes mellitus is very strongly associated with the frozen shoulder. And as we all know, that the diabetes, the type 2 diabetes mellitus will not have any symptom. Patient will be absolutely asymptomatic for months and years. And it is, in fact, it is said that frozen shoulder is one of the presentation of the diabetes. Now, why have I written the glycosylated hemoglobin? Because the frank diabetics, you can pick up on random sugar, where the sugars, if they're running above 200, they are generally frank diabetics. But there is a subset of patients who are pre-diabetics. And in pre-diabetics, your random sugar is going to be normal. On the practical ground, many of these patients come empty stomach to the hospital, thinking that the doctor would do my blood test. So if somebody's random sugar is actually hovering between, let's say, 160, 170, when he comes, presents to you, and by the time you send them for investigation, your sugar will be lowering up to 100, which is going to be missed as a normal sugar. So glycosylated hemoglobin should be done, which will pick up that 5.7 to 6.4, which is the pre-diabetes range. Recently, we conducted a study in Manipal on close to 150 patients. We have sent a study for publication on the patients who presented primarily to us with frozen shoulder. So grossly, I can tell you, one third were normal glycemics, one third were frankly diabetics, either on the, in the past or we got them diagnosed, and one third, mind it, one third were pre-diabetics. That high is the level of the pre-diabetes. And many of the pre-diabetics, actually the current endocrinologist in the beginning prefer to give them especially if they are above 6 to 6.1, they give them a short course of oral hypoglycemics, diet control, weight control, and once everything is under control, they actually take off the oral hypoglycemics. So it is very important that every patient, you must do the glycosylated hemoglobin. Thyroid profile, um, men, I have found it very rarely common, but women, you can say about 15 to 20% patients are subclinical hypothyroid. And this two group, this subclinical hypothyroid and the pre-diabetics, understand until you pick them up and you maybe start treating or take an endocrinologist as a physician opinion, they are hard to treat. Any other investigation, radiological? Um, so it's world over known that most of the time, uh, only when you have any other diagnosis in your mind, or let's say you feel the rotator cuff is weak or torn, that's the time you can do the ultrasound and an MRI. In ultrasound, it's one of very good investigation. We do very often in Manipal. Um, but I do normally now, now these days I do only when I have a, you know, I have a doubt of the rotator cuff tear, not exactly for the, for the frozen shoulder, but in the frozen shoulder, the thickened CHL, the coracohumeral ligament will be thickened. And if you use a power Doppler, you can find that the vascularity in the rotator interval might be increased. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So just a second. Okay, so now we move on to the next one. That is the, how do we treat? Now, this is a figure which is known to everybody. Everybody knows this is the stages of the frozen shoulder, where it is divided into freezing, frozen, and thawing by the reefs, followed by Nebiazer. I personally follow this stage. It is said that, you know, they have got kind of one third, one third, one third, six, six, six months, but it doesn't behave in that way. Initial stages are freezing stages, followed by frozen, and followed by thawing stages. Freezing means the tissues are under inflammation. There's intense inflammation going on in the shoulder, that is the rotator and towel, coracohumeral ligament, and the capsule. As the inflammation progresses, gradually we know that the sequelae of inflammation is always fibrosis. So the whole thing becomes fibrosed. And then the frozen shoulder, as it's known to everybody, it's a self-resolving condition. Gradually, the pain and stiffness disappears in the few months, I mean, few uh, months. Normally, it is said that it may take about 9 to 18 months in a normal person to get completely resolved. Um, 
diabetics may take longer, sometimes up to two to three years. And it is also a known phenomena that sometimes that this can go on for several years, five to seven years. I have some patients, one or two patients whom I have seen that, you know, it goes on for a long time. The treatment of this is based upon which stage they are in. So since they are in the stage of freezing, where there's a lot of inflammation, you best manage it conservatively. When they're in frozen stages, again, they mostly are managed conservatively. Very rarely surgical treatment is advocated. And thawing stage, since it is improving, you don't need any kind of surgery. Most of the time, conservative treatment is advocated. If you see, the, there are many things at the moment advocated for frozen shoulder, but these are the four most important things every orthopedic surgeon uses. Analgesics, some people use steroids, physiotherapy, and rarely surgery in which there are either the manipulation under general anesthesia or arthroscopic capsular release. So in the freezing stage, uh, analgesics among them, the most important is NSAIDs because you need to reduce the inflammation. So Analgesics without the, you know, the anti-inflammatory component like bear paracetamol may not really work or tramadol. They do give pain relief, but I think the best is NSAID. Muscle relaxants and pregabalin can be added. Some people prefer to add, no, but you know, it's the, the validity is questionable. Steroids can be given local or oral. I'll come back to it a bit later. Physiotherapy is, remember, physiotherapy is done only to retain the range of motion and not to regain. You gradually regain once the pain is less. But this is the single most important thing in the entire primary frozen shoulder in the freezing stage. Please advise your physiotherapist, do not do any kind of vigorous physiotherapy and do not use any kind of heat modalities like moist heat and shorter diathermy. They do all and a angry joint becomes much more angrier. If you ask a patient, they'll say, I was actually better, but once I started doing my physiotherapy, my shoulder has become worse. Because vigorous physiotherapy added with all heat modalities is a killer. Do not do that. Um, other, there are many other modalities I'm not going to touch, but I'm going to tell you hydrodilatation is coming big way. A lot of people are trying nerve blocks, the shockwave lithotripsy, calcitonin, acupuncture, etc. I'll pres primarily uh, we'll discuss only the first three. So the contentious issues. What are the contentious issues? Should you give analgesics physiotherapy or should you also add steroid? That is one. If you give steroid, these are our major contentions, local, oral, what is my root? What is the dose? Which molecule should I use? And what's the root? Should I give ultrasound guided? Should I give blind? And whatever you do, remember, post-steroid, I mean, once the inflammation has subsided, the most important thing is to start regaining the range of motion. Till then, you tell your patient, see, do what you wish to do within your pain comforts. I mean, don't overdo the things, but once your pain is less, we will start the good physiotherapy. Again, that is not very really aggressive. You teach the patient and let them do by themselves. So here, NSAIDs and physio versus steroid, I'll just write the study name, but I'll tell you what exactly has happened. Injections are far better in short term. Because remember, what do these steroids they do? They reduce the inflammation, they reduce the pain. And the minute pain is less, the patient can sleep well. Because all these patients, they suffer from terrible pain. You ask them, what is your main problem? They'll say, sir, it is so painful that I cannot sleep at night. And sleep is a very important indicator for health. So if you give steroid, they, the, the pain is less, they can sleep well. And once the inflammation is less, then you can start the physiotherapy. Should you give the steroid local or oral? There are many studies. There is a recent study. It's a randomized trial by Lorbeck. They said the local is better. And as an orthopedic surgeon, you must remember that the oral steroids can sometimes really cause avascular necrosis. And all of us are very, very scared about that. So I personally believe local steroids are far better. However, if somebody has got experience for decades, while giving oral steroids and no complication, fair enough. What is the site? Should I give intraanticular or should I give subacromial? Now, there are a couple of studies. This is one of the recent study by Shang et al. in 2019. They did a meta-analysis and systematic review and they found that overall there is no difference. However, the pain scores were better in intraanticular group, whereas subacromial group resulted in uh, more controlled blood glucose levels. 
but this is one area which has to be uh, which has to be explored i personally give more intraarticular because we believe that the pathology is in the joint around the rotator tendon and it can diffuse inside the entire joint there is a recent study published in ajsm where they have been actually injecting into the rotator tendon and they said that you know the pain scores range of motion and functional scores were quite good having said that i think these uh, this is one area again to be explored most surgeon give intraarticular and some tend to give in the subacromial space what's the dose of drug 10 mg 20 40 and this is generally regarding the trimcinolone so uh, there is no difference between 20 and 40 both are similar uh, 40 is considered to be high dose for 20 is considered to be you know medium and 20, the 10 mg is a lesser dose but 20 mg is certainly better than the 10 mg so maybe a intraarticular 20 mg or at the max 40 mg is a good choice what's the type of drug which you want to use should you use triamcinolone or dopamedrol there are two of them which are commonly used for almost a decade we used this uh, later we switched on for the reason because this was not available in the pharmacy the main problem with the dopamedrol is that it can precipitate and causes intense pain for first two days many of my patient came back they were almost like paralytic they said sir what have you injected in my shoulder my shoulder is very painful which apps almost absolutely disappeared with the trimcinolone so for almost like 5 years i have stuck now to trimcinolone i don't inject dopamedrol at all because dopamedrol did cause lot of uh, post injection one or two days pain however uh, and the same is studies also proving that the pain scores and range of motion are better in the trimcinolone what technique you want to use blind or ultrasound guided now uh, maybe my center is quite you know uh, i i'm uh, probably blessed by the good sonologists so we here in manipal give all injections in the shoulder only ultrasound guided one thing is for sure that the injection has gone for sure into the shoulder uh, they can also sometimes see if there's any cuff tear and all uh, but yes most of the world almost 80 to 90% of the people do give blind injection some of these studies recently have proven that there is some benefit of ultrasound guided over blind but it needs much more evaluation before it becomes a standard practice definitely it is more costly and in the you know the western world it becomes difficult to get an appointment if you ask for ultrasound guided probably you may get an appointment after a long time so that's the one reason the blinded techniques are still followed now once we have crossed the stage 1 where we have um, treated the pain got down the pain the next thing is always to start them on good supervised physiotherapy and let them continue physiotherapy and keep them on regular follow if the patient reaches to you in the stage 2 where he says my pain has been there for last 6 7 months 5 6 months pain is gradually coming down i'm a bit better i have taken treatment here there now i have finally come to you um it's a tricky stage it's a very stiff shoulder the lady what you saw the video was something like in the stage 2 it's a very stiff shoulder pain is there so you can give analgesics as per requirement steroids your wish if you feel pain component is quite more and has not let's say subsided after one course of your 3 weeks of analgesics i personally give for 3 weeks of analgesics if it has not subsided one steroid injection shall not harm the the physiotherapy is the key in this stage so you here you have to start regaining the range of motion and along in the glenohumeral range of motion and along with that the scapular stabilization and cuff isometrics are extremely important because unless the scapula is stabilized the cuff starts working the shoulder will not regain movement the other point what i have not written here is counseling you have to tell the patient that this disease or this condition is going to take some time it is it will not resolve overnight it may take so i usually say it may take about a pregnancy time it's like 9 months 9 months to 12 months if they are diabetic you have to tell them that it may go on for longer duration because unless they understand that this i cannot count every night that okay i have seen doctor two weeks back and why i am not better after two weeks no it's going to take time so counseling remains one of the very important part of the treatment of the frozen shoulder now if the, this phase goes on for a long time you have been seeing patient for two follow ups three follow ups four follow ups and it's almost reaching eight nine months and patient shows no change in his movement and his limitation of movement is affecting his activities of daily living which are pertinent for that patient in such cases you may plan for manipulation under anesthesia or 
arthroscopic capsular release. The point here, what I'm trying to make is this at the moment, whatever studies are there, though there are some studies, but most of the studies say this should be done when you are into six to nine months of the frozen shoulder. Do not attempt these things at let's say two months, three months. Why? Because it's a very angry inflamed joint. And jokingly, we say, you know, the angry joints and angry wives should not be touched. So don't touch them. Just, just let them become cool. If you are trying to touch, it's going to harm. Uh, we have seen patients who, who underwent arthroscopic capsular release in three months, manipulation at three months. They actually became worse. Some of them, they developed CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome. So do not touch in the early stage. Wait for about six to nine months. They do well. Now, what's the contention about? Everybody knows manipulation. Everybody knows ACR. What's the contention? Contention here is what's good. Now, logically, if you see manipulation is you are blindly manipulating. The left picture is just blind manipulation. The right picture is beautiful. You can see the rotate and double inflame, blah, blah. Logically, it seems that there are there have to be more complications in manipulation and arthroscopic capsular is a complication, less surgery. Said that, there are three recent trials. One is Rangan et al., our close friend Samit Rangan uh, uh, in, in, from UK. They have published their studies in Lancet, Lee, and Sundarajan, my close friend from Ganga Hospital, Coimbatore, India, has also published a randomized control trial, ACR versus MUA. And all say there is no benefit of scopic release or manipulation. Uh, if it is done, I mean, I, I would summarize in this fashion, if it is done by an experienced person who has seen, assisted, and treated this condition for a decade or so, is knows what exactly to be done in manipulation, you may not harm a patient. Having said that, if you're not really sure um, or you pick up a wrong patient, yes, there can be complications. So largely, theoretically, there is no difference between scopic release versus manipulation. When do you do the MOGA? After about six to nine months of onset of frozen shoulder, I told you why. Always tell the patient that there is a rarest possibility of fractures and cuff and labrum injuries, though in my almost like 15 years I've been treating shoulders, I never had one where I fractured a patient, I mean, shoulder or cuff or a labrum injury. Post MOGA, maybe you can add a steroid injection because when you break the capsule, there is going to be some hematoma, there's going to be some inflammation. It, it doesn't harm, just inject one steroid. And, but after the manipulation, the aggressive mobilization for several weeks is extremely important. Otherwise, the, it's going to come back, come back very hard. But you tell your diabetics and the, the thyroid patient that you may have a poor outcome. You will not, on table, they'll have a fantastic movement, full movement. But you observe them after a few weeks, they are back to, let's say, 60% what you gained on table. So you have to tell them that you are not the best candidate, though you'll be better. Don't ever try if you feel that the bones are porotic. And that's one reason why you should always do x-ray if you're planning MUGA. Secondary stiffness, if there's an instability rotator cuff tear, or somebody has tried MUGA and it has failed, then it is better to do arthroscopy. This is a brief steps of the MUGA. I usually start, it's done on the genesisia. You start, I start. This is a limited abduction. You can see this limited external rotation. So we start with flexion with a short lever arm. Scapula remains stabilized initially. Later, my assistant removed his hand. The key here is if one movement is not coming, leave it, go back to the other movement. So this flexion was gradually coming. From flexion, we went to abduction. And beyond 90 degree, I always ask my assistant to keep the hand in the axilla to prevent any inadvertent inferior subluxation of head of humerus. That's abduction. Then you try, try the external rotation. With a short lever arm. Then external rotation in a deduction. And then finally internal rotation and a deduction. So this is internal rotation. And then when you do the A deduction, that will break the entire posterior capsule. So this is going to break the posterior capsule. So this is how, and then we confirm that we have regained the entire range of motion. So this is how the manipulation is done. I personally always inject the shoulder with 40 milligram of triamcinolone. ACR, many times today in the, you know, the Google world, people come and they say, I want arthroscopic. I don't want a risk 
fair enough patient's preference osteoporotic bone secondary stiffness frail moga i i think um maybe i can just quickly rush through so you can see an inflamed contracted rotate tent table so what do i step so i usually start with release the rotate tent table release the mghl clear the peri subscapularis tissue means the front and the back of subscapularis tissue then cut the anterior inferior capsule change the portal go to anteriorly and start cutting the posterior capsule so this is how we are releasing the rotator interval start releasing the mghl so this is how i'll just quickly fast forward a little bit so this is the whole rotator interval is completely released you have to let the subscapulari start gliding i have to see the coracoid right here in the rotator tent table is the coracoid the coracoid must be seen avoid damaging the pulley of the biceps and that's how we can see the whole rotator tent table is open and next i usually put a scissor or sometimes a punch to start cutting the capsule about 5 mm from the labrum some people use a punch because they want to cut a bigger bite so and then we shift the scope in antero inferior portal and then we start cutting the posterior capsule this is from behind you can see so much anger in the joint still once this is done all around which we call is a 360 degree or you can say 270 because it starts almost from the front and goes till the back nobody releases on the top so this is up to the axillas some people here they prefer to actually do the manipulation at the end if you are confident you have done several hundreds of scope the scopies it's okay you are not going to damage the axilla now but it, it all depends upon the experience and you know your confidence i mean it it it's far off from here but yes there's always a risk so that's a complete global release of the capsule i personally always go to the subacromial space though there is pathologically there is no problem in the in the subacromial space but you can go and you can release the chl beautifully from here i can show you this is the this is the ca ligament follow the ca ligament go to the coracoid and then that ligament can be seen it is sometimes tough to release the chl completely from the rotator interval when you are visualizing from the joint so this is this is the coracoid actually it's almost here is the coracoid this the coracoid and this tissue bunch of tissue is actually that again i'll show you this is the ca ligament goes up to the coracoid and this bunch of tissue here is actually the chl which we are going to release it which attaches to the anterior margin of the supraspinatus that prevents the supraspinatus gliding also so you release this and that's what completes the complete release of the frozen shoulder la force has uh, you know describe because sometimes in frozen shoulder it's very tough to enter the joint very tough so what you can do is you can actually go to the subex space clean it from the front clean the rotator tent table from the sub, the the subacromial space and then enter the joint from the front and that's known as a la force technique i i do it once in a while because when when it is not possible from here so my take home message is when you see a patient with frozen shoulder without confusion rule out diabetes rule out pre diabetes because you know a patient will say no i'm not a diabetic do do the do random sugar and do the hypo, the the glycosylated hemoglobin and if it's a woman some features you can do hypothyroid test apart from plain x ray other radiological investigations are usually not done routinely unless you have a doubt of some pathology most patients almost 90 to 95% patient will respond to cocktail therapy of nsaids steroids and physiotherapy intraarticular steroids give good pain relief in the freezing phase don't hesitate doing that one shot injection is fantastic only thing is that remember in diabetics it can fluctuate their blood sugar level to about 10% for about 5 to 7 days so guard them because once i got shouted by a patient why you didn't tell me that it's it it changes the blood sugar level when you give analgesic always give analgesic only at bed time because the pain is terrible at night there's no point giving a painkiller in the morning always avoid vigorous physiotherapy in freezing phase that's a that's a disaster and diabetics and thyroids dysfunctionals are slow responder 
whatever you do, whether you do conservative or operative, they'll go slow. Their pain will go down, but the range of motion recovery is slow. So with this, I end my talk and thank you very much. Um, thanks, Srimas. Thank Professor Ahmed for this kind invitation from the, the Indian Orthopedic Association and the Egyptian Society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bandi, for, for this very interesting presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sarni Vas. Thank you so much for the uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation on uh, frozen shoulder. Uh, very interesting finding about the pre-diabetics. Um, uh, yes, we just uh, recently have sent to general shoulder elbow, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> mm, no, okay. we, we found almost 30 percent and then we were in, the, in while, while I was researching I found that in US if you see the teens close to 30 percent teens today in US are pre-diabetics can you imagine that is the strength I mean that common is pre-diabetes so in Manipal almost for last 10 years pre-diabetes screening is absolutely mandatory I don't see a patient unless or until he is pre-diabetic I mean, his glycosylated hemoglobin is done. And many a times, Srinivas, you'll find that their glycohb will be 5.9, 6. Now, it's very hard to say, yeah, we are doing only one single value. We repeat them after three to six months. And sometimes it comes back to normal. So you don't know that one value, what you got was just a lab error. Because the minute he is 5.8 and above, we say, okay, you control your diet. So when you repeat it after three months, you don't know, was it one coincidental error? Or did he improve after his dietary control? But yes, right. there's no sugar is anyway bad. <laughs> is there any way to predict how severe the, the stiffness will be uh, in these patients? Diabetics, and if they're poorly controlled diabetics, bad. The only case where we know that they are going to be terrible is a poorly controlled diabetics. If their glycohb is over 7.5, 8, 9, more the glycohb, they, they are going to be bad very stiff and they recur also you know you treat them i have now some patients who i have treated they became all right they come back after two years same shoulder you know we know generally it doesn't affect the same shoulder largely once it is gone gone but in diabetics if they have uncontrolled diabetes rarely it can affect the same shoulder and uh, regarding hydro distension um, what is your take on hydro distension for frozen shoulder Actually, we have done an RCT a few years back. One of the radiology uh, resident did the RCT and we were comparing. We didn't find much difference. Much difference. I mean, people are trying. A lot of people are trying. They have their own you know, um, experience. Since we are happy with the simple steroid, <laughs> we have been just doing that. But people are getting good result, And they do it somewhere between the freezing is ending and frozen is starting. Uh, what's your experience, Professor Mohammed Abdul? Do you try this? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't uh, use it. The, hy the hydro expansion, sir. No, I have no experience at all. Yeah, no experience. Okay, yeah. Most, most uh, because it becomes kind of a bit semi-invasive, you know. Yeah. So maybe okay, just inject and leave them. Yeah. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, yes sir. sir please. Please. Uh, first of all, thank you for an amazing uh, presentation. Uh, frozen shoulder is uh, one of my favorite subjects, and uh, actually, uh, I, I do see a lot of patients. Uh, I have a question about diabetics, and when you need to give a local uh, corticosteroid injection in diabetics, what are the precautions uh, regarding the blood glucose level and the possibility of infection, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Okay, so one, one must never give a steroid injection if they're first time diagnosed diabetics, especially the frank diabetes. Okay, I'm not talking about the pre-diabetes. If they're first time frankly diagnosed diabetics, do not give. Let them control the sugar, let them come after one month, number one. Number two is if somebody is having an uncontrolled diabetes, like there's no definition, but generally we avoid giving anything above 225 or 230 above. Uh, then it is not prudent. Though there is no, I, I, I didn't come across any value per se. Like okay, three hundred is the cutoff, three fifty. But generally speaking, two fifty around. I say, I said okay, you go and come back after three weeks. We'll give then. So uncontrolled diabetes, first time diagnosed, frank diabetics, we don't give injections. Um, the what was the other question? 
No, actually, this is the first question, and the other question is about physiotherapy because uh, you okay, said. One, one thing, I'll, I'll just add to that. So, if somebody is a diabetic, and if you give the the injection, do tell them that your sugar might fluctuate about let's say about five percent, ten percent for next four five days. As I was telling, I got shouted by a patient, and then she oh. had a fluctuation. She said, "You never told me." My cutoff level is two hundred uh, random. Actually, I also follow this. 200 is my cutoff, but rarely I've gone till 220. But as as you very rightly said, 200 is the cutoff. I mean, I don't go above this. Yeah. And the uh, other question is about uh, physiotherapy, because you mm -hmm. said that most of patients in the frozen stages, they respond well to physiotherapy, but then not any kind of physiotherapy. I mean, not heat therapy, not laser, not ultrasound. It must be a structured program. And I would like to know, uh, what do you think about that? Um, I, I completely agree. So it's a mix of all. So you might have given the mus analgesics with muscle relaxant from your side. I do tell them to apply some local applicants and do some, do some heat therapy at home just to relax their tissues. I do send them for our own structured you know, protocol, why physiotherapy is what they follow. I mean, I, I don't keep a track much of it, but they have a structured protocol to start you know, the glides and... But if you carefully, you know, if you see the Egypt and India, we are almost the same in many things. Our patients, once they listen, once they go to physiotherapist, they know what has to be done. Then they go in far off some village, they stay there, they do everything at home. So I think a lot of things, you know, which you call it a supervised neglect. You teach them, you tell them, okay, you do. I tell them actually to do what is what is being done by the students in the PT class. Lift up, take back, take it back couple of exercises, you know, supine sometimes, because when you do the exercises in supine, the scapula is stable. You know, the otherwise what happens, you saw that video of a lady, they move a lot, but actually there's no movement at glenohumeral joint. So I also tell them often that you actually lie supine, you take those rods, you know, they give them bars and that helps them stretching the shoulder a lot. But the, the exact protocol, I think, is followed by the physiotherapist. I personally don't keep much track. But if you see them in about six months' time, nine months, they improve a lot. They get good functional range. If you exactly measure, they'll be less. And especially the external rotation in adduction is poor. But the, they're, they're most important is this. If this comes back, they're happy. Because they can tie you know, their hairs. They can clean the face. Uh, well, from your point of view, which is the movement which is most difficult to get back and 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 it's quite disabling internal rotation internal rotation can be very disabling in women you know because you know one is cleaning the back but most of the time tying their the garments is extremely difficult it doesn't reach so ir takes a long time it can go up to 17 18 months sometimes that's the most tricky even after the acr and manipulation you might have seen that's the last moment to come yeah, sure. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Professor Elisha, please. please Thank you, sir. Uh, Professor Bandi, uh, if you would like to do uh, manipulation under general anesthesia, do you prefer to do it once or you prefer to repeat it? And if you repeat it, what's the uh, minimal time interval between each time you repeat it? No, I, I don't think, sir, I've ever repeated it in my life. Just it's one. Only one time. It's only one time. It's a one-time procedure. If you have to repeat, it means that there is something goes wrong either then or now. Yes. Your your indication, your timing, or something was wrong, or something you're missing because I have never, I mean, reached that stage. So most of the time we do only once, somewhere between six to nine months. That's the timing. Yes, sir. What about your opinion, sir, in hyaluronic acid injection in frozen children? Do you prefer it or it hasn't? I, I hear some, I read some uh, of the literatures using it, but I, I am not sure of the results of uh, using hyaluronic acid. I'm also absolutely not sure of any logic. There's some people who I've used, they say it reduces, reduces the friction, but the problem is the cost to benefit ratio. I mean, I'm yeah. just giving a very, you know, audacious comment. You know, these injections are, you know, in Indian currency, it is something like 16 to 18,000 or 20,000 rupees. And, you know, I mean, there's absolutely no cost to benefit ratio. Why are you giving hyaluronic acid? This is in, to increase the lubrication, whereas the frozen shoulder is not the lubrication problem. It's a problem of inflammation followed by contraction. Yeah. Somebody has also asked a question about PRP. You know, should you be giving PRP in frozen shoulder? Again, PRP is for healing. You know, it's all about healing and we don't have a healing issue. So there are some studies, but they have found absolutely no role of PRP in the uh, frozen shoulder. There is no 
proven role at the moment. See, some studies give you some differing opinions, but what we discussed today is at the moment standard. NSAIDs, physiotherapy, steroids, and the surgical. Rest all, you know, people are trying calcitonin. The, the actually a lot of work has been done on this extracorporeal shortwave lithotripsy, that machine. But they're all, you know, not every center will have. So I think we stick on to those four standard principles of managing physiotherapy, the frozen shoulder. Thank you, sir. Uh, there's one more question, sir, uh, from Dr. Gamal Kasim. Uh, can lidocaine affect the concentration dose of triamcinolone, and what's ideal concentration of local anesthetic? So normally, uh, people use about anywhere between three to five ml, and it should be given in two separate, you know, possible syringes because uh, depomidrol definitely precipitates. You can see precipitating if you mix it together. So you know you have to have two syringes, one loaded with the triamcinolone, one loaded with the 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 lidocaine. And again, lidocaine, there are some petri dish studies which say that lidocaine can be a bit uh, chondrotoxic. So people actually advocate ropivacaine. But I again, you know, I again despise these, you know, petri dish studies because millions and millions and trillions of such injections would have been given till date across the globe. And nobody has got any cartilage issue till date. So I'm fine. I, I think lidocaine or ropivacaine works very well. But about three to five miles because you don't have much space in the joint. Okay. There's one question on MRI. Just before that question, I just want to ask you, um, in a suspected case of frozen shoulder, typically, what percentage of patients do you ask for an MRI scan? Nil. Yeah. Okay. okay. Nil. I mean, so if I am 100% sure, so I always do the clinical examination. So in Manipal, we always try actually first with sonology, ultrasound. I, I'm sure that, you know, a lot of centers do not have. So where, the, where you do not have uh, MRI is the investigation of choice, of course. But if you have a good sonologist, it's fantastic. You know, it rules out. It gives you the CHL thickness. It tells you the rotator and devil is contracted. It does gives you a brief idea whether the, you know, there's any major cuff tear or not. But smaller partial cuff tears. Okay, let me bring a very interesting point. Smaller partial cuff tears of, let's say, 30%, 25%, bursal or articular are pretty common. Now, what are you going to do? And if you see the supraspinatus, if you see this is supraspinatus, this is anterior third, middle third, and posterior third. Most of these tears are in middle third, posterior third, which are outside the cable. They don't affect the shoulder function primarily. If you see this tear, the radiologist will report a tear. The tear goes into the brain of patient. Now, you may be itching to do a surgery. If a shoulder is operated, which is stiff and has got a partial cuff tear, you, are, you have landed in a trouble absolute trouble because we know by literature that partial cuff tears when you repair they land up a stiffness everybody knows they don't behave in the same fashion as if the full thickness cuff tear and now you have operated a stiff shoulder with a query coincidental partial cuff tear it's a mess i learned it in very hard way in my early career and i just don't operate these patients yes if the tear is almost inching to 90 percent nearly 100 percent maybe you can take a call. Okay, wait for a while because partial tears don't progress. At least get rid of stiffness for the time being. You give some injections, they'll become anyway full thickness. You can operate it after a while. So my, my indications for MRI is only when I'm in doubt and my ultrasound is not good. I mean, I brought in a completely new point because a lot of beginners, they see this tear and they put their hand. It's a mess. So it, it depends on the experience and expertise of the sonologist. If you have one, then you can yes. um, go for an ultrasound. Otherwise, yes. MRI is indicated. Yes. There was just one question um, on MRI, actually. Would you do an MRI um, uh, before you do a local injection was the question. No, again, you see, um, um, okay, for the people who are doing ultrasound guided, like me, I'm fine because my sonologist will anyway see. If he has got a major issue, God, he will inform me. I will abandon. The people who do not, then it becomes upon your clinical judgment. If you're ever in doubt, then don't do. Then do an MRI. Be sure that you are dealing with a frozen shoulder only. But in experience, and like Professor Mohammed, Abdul, or anybody who has spent 10 years in orthopedics, it, I, I think most of the time you can pick up that you it's a frozen shoulder. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pandey. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll move on to the uh, next talk, Professor Lasha. Yes.
Thank you so much, Professor Bandy, for uh, this uh, very interesting presentation. And thank you for, uh, very much, sir, for being with us uh, in uh, this uh, very fruitful uh, webinar. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Now, our next speaker, thank you, sir. Our next speaker will be uh, Professor Absalam Aid. Professor Absalam Aid is a professor of orthopedic surgery, Zagazig University, and the uh, former uh, dean of Zagazig University, and uh, one of the administrative board of the Egyptian Orthopedic Association. And he's uh, highly specialized in uh, shoulder region, shoulder surgery, and uh, shoulder pathology. Professor Absalam. You are muted, Professor Absalam. Thank you, sir, very much for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, our colleagues who are uh, co-chairing this uh, fruitful um, webinar. Uh, allow me, please, to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. We are now going to speak about the letter J procedure and And uh, today we are going to learn about the indications in primary and revision instability cases. We're going to learn about the humoral and the glenoid bony defects. We're going to learn about the rationale of the procedure, the surgical technique, uh, open or arthroscopic, and uh, uh, the variations of the procedure and the results and complications. So it was first described by a French uh, surgeon, Michel Letterger, in 1954. Similar procedures have also been used, such as the Bristol procedure in the UK and the Bochev procedure in Russia. Globally, however, the lethargy procedure has become a very popular procedure due to its low recurrence rate and excellent published results. When is it indicated? It is indicated if there is glenoid bone loss following failed soft tissue stabilization, and in current trends, some surgeons would perform the letter J procedure even on first-time dislocations in individuals who are deemed high risk for ongoing instability. So who are the patients at risk? Those are the patients with large bony defects, either bony bankrupt lesions or hill sex lesion. Young age at the first dislocation, male sex, previous episodes of instability if they have been numerous previous episodes and participation in higher level sporting activities such as national level or uh, championships etc and the most reliable predictive factors are the age and sex so young male patients are at high risk this is the instability severity index score and this is a simple test which was uh, devised by Boileau and his group and it um, puts a score on several items and uh, collectively it gives a score to the patient. The items that we score are the uh, age at the time of surgery below 20, above 20, the degree of sports uh, participation whether competitive or recreational or none, the type of sports, if it is contact or forced overhead and uh, other sports, if there is hyperlexity or not, if there is hill sex on the AP radiograph, and if there is glenoid uh, loss of contour on the AP radiograph. Now, uh, collectively, we give uh, points to a, each of these uh, items, and then we get a score. If the score is less than three, this means that uh, and of course, the total points are 10 points. If the score is less than three out of 10, this means that the patient has less than 5% chance of recurrence and an arthroscopic repair is uh, likely to succeed. If the patient has more than six, then there is 70% chance of recurrence and the uh, arthroscopic procedure is uh, likely to uh, not succeed or to fail. But then the dilemma is when the uh, ISIS score is between three and six, this has a five to 10% chance of recurrence. And in which case, arthroscopic uh, may be uh, uh, successful, but may need another additional procedure such as remplissage or something else. Now, what about the bone loss? We first would like to talk about the glenoid bone loss. If there is a bone loss in the anteroinferior quadrant of the glenoid, 
that is uh, about 30% uh, of the diameter of the inferior glenoid, the contact area across the entire glenoid is decreased by a mean of 40%. So just loss of 30% in the anterior inferior glenoid will reduce the contact area of the entire glenoid by 41%. Whereas the mean contact pressure for the entire glenoid will be increased by 100%, and in the anterior quadrant will be increased by 300 to 400%. So in this case, an isolated soft tissue bank heart repair would have to resist the 300 to 400% increase of overload in this bone soft tissue repair interface, and this would put it at a risk of, of failure. The anteroinferior uh, glenoid bone loss uh, equal to or more than 25% uh, must be addressed by glenoid bone grafting. And this may be in the form of a coracoid graft, that is the letter J procedure, an iliac graft, or an aloe graft. The health sex lesion previously has been described as engaging or non-engaging. Engaging health sex lesion engages the anterior glenoid in a position of athletic function, that is 90% of abduction combined with external rotation of approximately 90%. So if the patient in the position of dislocation, the heel sex lesion engages the anterior glenoid, it is an engaging heel sex lesion. Now this concept has uh, uh, evolved into another concept called the glenoid tract. As the arm is raised, the glenoid contact area shifts from the inframedial to the supralateral portion of the posterior articular surface of the humeral head. So if the arm is by the side, the, uh, the glenoid contacts the inframedial portion of the posterior articular surface of the humeral head. But as the arm goes up, uh, the glenoid contact becomes with the uh, uh, supralateral portion of the posterior articular surface of the humeral head, and this area is known as the glenoid tract. Uh, if there is an intact glenoid tract without significant bone loss, this guarantees bone stability. Here, in, uh, in this case, uh, the hill sex lesion in the position of, of external rotation and athletic activity is within the glenoid tract. It does not fall off the glenoid tract. There is no anterior deficiency of the glenoid, and all of the hill sex lesion is still within an intact glenoid. This means it is an on-track lesion. But if there is a deficiency of the anterior inferior glenoid like this, then the hill sex lesion is likely to fall off the glenoid and uh, cause a dislocation, and this is called an off-track lesion. So the ISIS score, which ha we have entailed before, has been modified, and this uh, uh, the items uh, of the uh, glenoid sclerotic line and hill sex have been collected, the four points, into an evaluation of the bone loss on 3D CT. So if it is an on-track lesion, it is given a zero. If it is an off-track lesion, it is given uh, four points. And as you see, we have discussed before that if the uh, if the score is above six, then a bony procedure is likely. And if you have an off-track lesion, you already have four uh, points. So if by chance you are uh, a young patient, or if you have contact sports, or if you are competitive in sports, then this definitely requires a bony surgery. Are there contraindications of the lethargy procedure? Yes. In the throwing athlete, the lethargy procedure produces some restriction of the range of motion. So it is uh, not advised in the throwing athlete. If there is no bone loss, then there is no need for a lethargy procedure. If there is an arthropathy, then, uh, and there is a future need for arthroplasty, then this would require an arthroplasty, not a lethargy procedure. If there is a massive vertebral cuff tear, as in elderly people, this is an indication for reverse shoulder arthroplasty. What is the surgical principle of the letter J? In brief, it is passing an osteotomized coracoid process graft with attached conjoint tendon 
through horizontal split in the subscapularis and then securing it onto the anterior surface of the glenoid. So again, we take uh, the coracoid and we osteotomize a piece of it, length between 22 to 27 millimeters, and the conjoint tendon is still attached. We make a slit in the a horizontal slit in the subscapularis, and then we attach the graft onto the inferior uh, anterior surface of the glenoid where the bony defect has occurred. What is the rationale of the procedure or how does it work? It works in three ways to improve anterior stability. Number one, it increases or restores the glenoid contact surface area. Actually, you are putting a graft where the defect has been, and therefore you are restoring the glenoid bone deficiency and restoring the glenoid tract, and therefore you are improving the, the contact area that the the, glenoid, the humeral head has to go before it can dislocate. And actually, this is the idea behind free tissue transfers, free grafts that is uh, practiced by some people. So a first uh, item is that increases or restores the glenoid contact surface area. Number two, when you elevate and external rotate the shoulder, when the arm is abducted and external rotated, the conjoint tendon provides anterior support and, uh, of the anterior inferior capsule, and therefore it stabilizes the joint, the conjoint tendon, by reinforcing the inferior subscapularis and anterior inferior capsule. Number three is that as part of the procedure, you do also repair of the capsule, and this adds to the stability. In addition, by the end of the procedure, you tie, you, you suture the uh, conjoint tendon to the subscapularis. This provides a tethering of the subscapularis, and therefore it restricts the external rotation a little bit, which also is helpful in preventing dislocation. So this is the surgical technique, the open surgical technique. It's a deltopectoral approach. You open the deltopectoral approach, you retract the pectoralis and the deltoid, you retract the uh, uh, vein, and then you open the clavic pectoral fascia. And you uh, proceed a little bit on the uh, medial side of, uh, on the lateral side of the coracoid in order to take a piece of the coracoacromial ligament. This is helpful in capsular repair later on. And what we are seeing is a right shoulder, to the right is the medial, and to the left is uh, the uh, lateral. Now you proceed to uh, dissect tissues of the medial surface of the uh, coracoid process using uh, electrocautery. And then you use a, a saw. Uh, preferably with a 90 degree blade in order to osteotomize the coracoid. You complete with an osteotome and then you grab it with a cocker. Now that you have osteotomized the coracoid, you, you start by uh, uh, removing the uh, this uh, extra shell of bone, and then you like uh, abrade the uh, deep surface of the coracoid with a burr or with the saw, and you uh, put your uh, screw holes, you pre-drill your screw holes, two holes uh, with sufficient uh, distance in between, and then you retract the coracoid with the glenoid away, now you are splitting horizontally the subscapularis. And then you reach the front of the glenoid. You put a home and retractor on the uh, uh, anterior surface of the glenoid. Now we are clearing the anterior surface of the glenoid and the uh, uh, defect in the anterior inferior glenoid, and you are uh, uh, roughening it with a burr, and then you place a hole. You measure 
and then you put your screw in the inferior hole, pass it through the hole that you drilled in the glenoid, and then through the uh, upper hole that you drilled in the coracoid, you drill the second hole into the glenoid and pass your screw. I prefer to use fully threaded screws and you over drill the coracoid and you may use washers. And then at the end of the procedure, now that you have uh, uh, attached the coracoid, you may uh, use anchors in order to uh, uh, make a banker repair in addition to the bony procedure. And in this case, it is useful to have the extra piece of the coracochromial ligament as a reinforcement to the capsule. Now you see that the conjoint tendon is coming out. There is the glenoid. The conjoint tendon is coming out be between the two parts of the subscapularis. So you repair the subscapularis and you tie the uh, tie the uh, conjoint tendon to the subscapularis, and this concludes the procedure. So, uh, are there uh, variations in the technique? Well, yes. Actually, the, what we have seen uh, uh, just uh, before is the French technique or the Walsh and Boileau the technique. And this technique uses the inferior or posterior surface of the glenoid to put it on the, uh, um, uh, of the coracoid to put it on the glenoid. Uh, in, in comparison to the Debord technique, Debord technique or it's called the congruent arch technique. This uh, uh, surgeon, he uh, claims that the uh, undersurface of the, of the coracoid has a matching curvature to the curvature of the glenoid. So he would place the coracoid uh, on its side. So uh, like you rotate the coracoid uh, and, and put the um, medial surface of the coracoid on the glenoid, and thereby you make a matching curvature, uh, but this has the drawback that the area in, in uh, contact with the glenoid bone is smaller. Again, this is the congruent arc technique and this is the French technique. What about the Bristol procedure? The Bristol procedure was uh, so thought by some people to be synonymous with the liturgy, but actually it's not. Uh, the Bristol procedure is uh, just like a tenodis, but with a piece of bone. You take just the tip of the coracoid, not you. You don't take a, a long uh, piece of the coracoid, and also you put the tip end on here, so it just benefits from the tenodis effect rather than from the bone uh, block or the bone graft effect. The bite shift procedure, I have uh, read about it in preparation for this lecture, but I've never seen it. In this procedure, the surgeon would osteotomize the coracoid, then pass the conjoint tendon with the coracoid underneath the subscapularis, and then would place the tip of the coracoid again in the coracoid. So he just passed the conjoint tendon under the subscapularis, and therefore, by rerouting the tendon, he made a tenodesis. Now, uh, arthroscopic lethargy, this is quite a demanding procedure. Uh, it requires a high level of expertise, but this is uh, uh, the recent uh, trend. The surgeon here has cleared the undersurface of the coracoid. He passes a 
uh, tight rope button. Then he does osteotomy. Then he uh, clears the tissue from the front of the glenoid with the arth arthroscopic instruments. Also placing anchors to make an additional bank art repair. Then the surgeon would uh, pass a, a guide in order to make the anteroposterior uh, track through which the tight rope is going to function. Then he proceeds to split the subscapularis and pass the conjoint tendon through the split. As you see here, the, that's the guide where he's going to pass his uh, tight rope. And here is the crocoid going uh, back to fit on the glenoid, anterior glenoid surface through the split in the subscapularis. And placing the posterior button. So uh, what about the results and complications of lethargy procedure? In a recent systematic review, patient reported outcomes of good to excellent in 90%. However, recent studies cite high risk of complications such as infection, recurrent, recurrence of the instability, and neurological injury. This is uh, not a, um, a, a simple procedure. It's a, a major procedure with osteotomy and transfer of bone and tendon, etc. So there is likelihood of infection. There is likelihood of failure to correct the instability if you fail to place the uh, coracoid graft uh, properly, and there's possibility of neurological injury to any of the surrounding important nerves with a total complication rate reaching in some studies 30%. So the take home message is, remember the glenoid bone deficiency and if it is more than 25%, we should resort to a bony procedure. Remember the hill sex lesion, engaging and non-engaging, also the on track and off track. Remember the instability severity index score and its modification. Remember that the transfer has triple effect of restore, restoring the glenoid bone, the tendon sling effect, and the repair, repairing of the capsule. Remember the French technique and the congruent arc technique. And also remember the arthroscopic lethargy procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Absalam, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I know that uh, lethargy uh, operation is a demanding. Uh, procedure uh, and uh, the results are uh, in most cases successful but i want to ask you a question sir uh, what do you prefer to do if you got the boom block intraoperative boom block fracture or post operative boom block non-union and uh, resorption uh, i uh, i if you, if you get a fracture of the boom block in intraoperatively this is a devastating complication i i have not uh, had any of this uh, luckily enough but uh, you have to be careful uh, number one to make a, take a significant portion of the uh, coracoid so that you have enough bone stock to work on also you have to uh, carefully place your drills uh, in the middle of the glenoid and this is 
why it is uh, easier in my hands to do the French technique rather than the Pongrant arc technique because the width of the crocoid uh, in the French technique, you, you, you work on the whole width and you can uh, easily place the uh, drill hole in the center of this uh, width. Uh, whereas in the congruent arc technique, you work on the, uh, the anteroposterior diameter of the, of the coracoid, and uh, by misplacing um, one millimeter to the right or to the left, you may fracture uh, the cortex. Also, you have to space the two holes uh, apart, at least half a centimeter, better one centimeter apart, so that you can place your screws that they don't break. Um, then you, if you don't have union, yeah, this may occur, but still you have, uh, you may have good results because you have uh, fibrous union and this uh, also creates a tenodesis effect. You, you work now by the tenodesis effect and the restriction of external rotation rather, by, by, rather than by the, um, uh, the bone block effect. And um, uh, actually, uh, I have been taught that uh, in the letter shape procedure, you distort the anatomy. So it results in horrible adhesions, which are probably useful for uh, prevention of instability. So just by transferring the tendon, you get uh, uh, stability because uh, the, the transferred tendon uh, forms adhesions to its surroundings, and this reinforces the capsule. Yes, sir. And in case of failed lethargy, what's your next step? Well, in case of failed, I have not seen this, but in case of failed lethargy, you may need to do some form of free bone graft because uh, this usually means that there is a major defect in the glenoid and you have to resort to that. And there have been uh, studies, uh, including one in our institute, that compared uh, the free graft to coracoid graft and uh, it cites almost equal results. So by uh, improving the glenoid bone stock, you may, uh, by, by just improving the bone stock, you may uh, uh, allow for a greater range of motion before the humeral head can fall off the, the glenoid tract. And, uh, but I just would like to mention that if you transfer the coracoid and then you have to come back to the shoulder, you must uh, be extremely careful because the anatomy has been distorted and uh, there is a lot of adhesions and then you may find the muscular cutaneous nerve directly in your face or something. Yes, sir. Dr. Sanivas. Thank you very much, sir, for an excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, I have uh, just two questions, one on the procedure and one um, about the rehab, actually. Uh, the procedure, uh, what size screws do you use and how do you decide on the length? And uh, what is the minimum distance you give between the two screws? Well, uh, as I said before, uh, we, we need to make a compression uh, effect between the coracoid and the glenoid. So, it is uh, logical to assume that you can use partially threaded uh, cancelless screws, but then I always have fear that if you overshoot, I mean, if you don't measure your length uh, pretty accurately, then your threads may go beyond the posterior glenoid and you lose your fixation. So I prefer to use fully threaded 3.5 millimeter screws and I over drill the coracoid as a whole with a 3.2 drill bit and I use a 2.7 drill bit for the uh, glenoid and the, I use washers, at least one washer in one of them and this provides good uh, uh, leg effect. As for the minimum distance, I would say five to seven millimeters, probably one centimeter is better. But then it still depends on how much glenoid, uh, how much coracoid you have. Yes. Yeah. And what is your post-op rehabilitation? So, Yeah, I put the patient in a sling for one month. Then I start a range of motion for one month. Then I start uh, muscle strengthening for one month. And I restrict all contact sports to beyond six months. Dr. Pandey, do you do anything different or do you do the same technique? Um, 
Okay, I basically don't stitch the capsule. I mean, I, I when I split the go beyond this subscap, you have the two capsule, two ends of the capsule. So I initially only I actually put the two ethy bonds on the superior inferior leaflet because once the coracoid jumps in, you know, you will not be able to find the inferior part. So I put the ethy bond right in the beginning, number one. Uh, most of the time I don't uh, repair any labrum <laughs> because I believe this is all it works. Initially, I used to take a piece of that's uh, the coraco, this thing, acromio coracoid ligament. Okay. But then what happens that piece of the ligament is like this and it often blocks your vision where have you placed your graft exactly there or your medial or lateral. So I've stopped doing that. I thought, okay, I'll just leave it because I got trained with Porcellini in Italy and they would never do all this. So I thought, okay, just leave this. So that's about the, and fixation wise, I usually use only the four, the, the four mm candidated cancellous screws, half threaded, which will anyway give a compression. Uh, washers, very rarely, if I have a doubt, as Professor Abdul was telling, if you have a doubt, you can always use one washer. Fair enough, absolutely fine. Um, then rehab almost, as he said, you know, you have to go slow because if you let these jumping jacks jump, na, they'll go back to sports in three months and then everything will go haywire. So six months is a fair enough time. I have a confession to make. I don't make a concomitant bank card repair, but that was in the video, so I had to mention it. And okay. I also I also don't like the piece of a coraco acromia ligament, but that was in the video. Correct. This video is not mine, but I, I downloaded it yeah, for the no, I but did, actually, I always... just as you said, when, once you put the coracoid on the glenoid, you don't see anything else. I mean, yes. it blocks the... But then uh, the, the, the important thing that I uh, did not mention in the lecture, and uh, I would like to hear what you think about it, is how you place your coracoid. This is uh, the real issue, how you place your coracoid. Because if, if you place it a little bit medially, it will fail. If you place it a little bit laterally, it will fail up and down, etc. So... What do you say about that? Um, Sorry. So that that I have a little trick. So what I usually do is, I mean, yes, you can place it a bit medial. Absolutely no problem. One millimeter medial is no problem. If it goes one millimeter lateral, then you have to bar it. You know, you can't leave it. Definitely you can't leave it lateral. The my my technique to place it, I usually what I do once I've drilled, once the glenoid is prepared, I actually place one of the screws. So listen to me carefully. If I had the video, I could have shared. So I place a screw half the way where it is just here jetting out. And I use a screwdriver, screwdriver over the screw. And then I use that screwdriver along with the screw to navigate how exactly I want it to place. Because it is so deep that your fingers can't keep on holding. Though Arthrex has got a set, but it is, you know, more often a, a cosmetic, you know, it's it's very many times very difficult. So one of the best ways is to hold a with the, use a screwdriver, put a small screw right in the beginning, which is, which you can later, you know, you not reuse it. And that screwdriver will help you in placing your graft. It just holds it there. Other hole, the top hole, you can actually use a 2, two mm K wire. 2 mm K wire. Okay, now your graft is fixed. It is fixed on top. It can still toggle this way. If you feel that it is a bit anterior, you can always change it. Then, through that screw, through that screw, the screw is still there. Through that screw, I pass a that guide wire. Because remember, the guide wires are quite thin, which are going to go through the 4 mm candidated cancellous screw. And I place the guide wire. So on the top hole, you have a K wire, 2 mm. Here on the lower one, I have a screw, which is just half the way through the graft. In that, the guide wire goes. And then I check the position. Now, if my position is perfectly all right, what I do, I remove the the top K wire, and in that I freehand I pass a guide wire. Then I use a 2.7 drill bit, drill, and that's it. I can show. I mean, some days maybe you know, some days we can share that video. It's a very very easy technique, and I have never erred, you know, because you have a lot of still a time to play. Other ways you can measure the coracoid depth, you know, the thickness. Then you exactly do that. But once you have made a hole on the glenoid, big holes, you can't go back. So I have found this much, much more easier. I can always do this way or that way if I feel that I have placed it wrong. Yeah, I think it all goes back to the first uh, inferior hole. Uh, I usually put the inferior hole in the middle of the coracoid from medial to lateral. 
and then uh, I make a judgment on the size of this coracoid, and then I make uh, my first hole in the glenoid, the inferior one, um, equal to the distance between the uh, middle of the coracoid and its uh, free edge, so that by placing uh, this uh, screw, I usually put a, a, a screw, and then I put it, like you said, with the <coughs> screwdriver, uh, I put it a little bit protruding so as to find the, the hole, you know, and then uh, as you tighten uh, the, uh, you know, the coracoid will fall in place. What I want to say that if it is a, a too much medial, then you lost the bone block effect and, and this is a failure. If it is too much lateral, then you impinge on the humeral head and this is also not uh, likely, but then uh, I'm, uh, I'm again pleased uh, uh, to hear what you have said. Well, when you tighten the screw, sometimes it moves sideways like that, rotates, and then you have to check with your finger because actually the, you cannot see anything. You cannot see the glenoid anymore. You have to check with your finger to see that it is in line with the glenoid, and then you put your guide wire and you put your second screw. Thank you so much. I think uh, Professor Bandy and Professor Absalem, you have answered the, the question from our one of our attendees. How uh, can I know the exact position of the uh, coracoid? You have already uh, answered it. Thank you so much. Uh, you. I think we have uh, no other questions. Uh, Dr. Senivas, do you have any other question? Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much. Finally, I would like to thank uh, our dear uh, attendees and our dear professors. Uh, Professor uh, Vivid Bandi from India, Professor Absalamayi from Egypt, my dear friend, the Professor Sir Nives, the Egyptian Orthopedic Association and the Indian Orthopedic Association. Thank you so much and see you next Friday, inshallah. Thank you so much. Have a nice Thank time. You.